I'm just going to ask uh, our panel to, to my right just to introduce themselves uh, and to give you just a, a little bit of an idea of other things that you need to be thinking about if you haven't been thinking about it, and then we'll get into the question and answer time. So I'll just hand over to Mark Rackley Gale. Thanks, Brian. My name is Mark Rackley Gale. Um, I lead a team within BNZ called Future Hub. So for the last four and a half years, we've been uh, helping customers manage EQC and insurance payments and settlements. Um, about two years ago, we realised as a bank that uh, a lot of customers were struggling in terms of uh, finding it frustrating to get accurate advice uh, regarding both financial issues and um, the ever-changing property situation in Canterbury. We set up a team of specialists in um, Christchurch to help people, and um, these uh, are not just for our own customers, but for non-BNZ customers as well, uh, which is the team we called Future Hub. So we work with uh, insurance, EQC, RAS, CTAS uh, and others. And so far over the last couple of years we've helped over 4,500 people um, find a way forward and over 500 of those have been non-BNZ customers. Key message from me, Renee's done a great job of um, uh, reiterating why the banks are actually so important in the whole process and should be uh, engaged and involved uh, at a very early stage. So. Um, um, Getting good outcomes really means making informed decisions. If, you're, um, if you have a mortgage, then uh, really don't avoid a vital conversation right at the very start, um, because the bank will need to be involved in the whole process. Um, and it's better to understand what your options are up front, rather than after you've already gone down a certain pathway. So, um, you know, your bank will actually try and make it work. They will try and find ways to get a, uh, a successful resolution. Uh, they won't be there to get in the way. So pretty much that's it. You know, it's really important. Engage your bank, talk to your bank uh, right in the beginning. Thank you. Evening, everyone. My name's Nikki Goss. I'm one of the managers from the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service. So we're the service stream that the government put in place to assist earthquake-affected residents with their temporary accommodation, firstly. So the matching and placement team help people find suitable, affordable accommodation for their time while they have to be out of their home. We also manage the temporary villages that the government put in place to support the housing situation earlier on in the piece, um, which is still in place. We, I, well, I manage the temporary accommodation assistance team, so that's the financial package that's in place to support a homeowner when they've exhausted their temporary accommodation allowance from their insurance company to assist with their temporary accommodation costs ongoing. And the third hat <laughs> um, is one of the managers for the Earthquake Support Coordination Service. So that's a collaboration of government and non-government agencies here in Canterbury using their business as usual skills to support homeowners through what is a complex situation when they need a bit of support with other agencies or even finding a way and which agencies to go to. So my tip tonight is around temporary accommodation assistance, the financial side of that. You have heard around that it comes mostly in your cash settlement. Sometimes it's gobbled up in the figure and it's really important that you understand what that is. If you're going to be out of your home for a period of time where that money is exhausted, and it doesn't necessarily take that long to exhaust, you need to talk to us before you decide on your cash settlement to understand what your eligibility to the government's assistance is, if, depending on the intention that you have. It does make a difference around what your intention is, the time frame in which you might be going to do it and how that looks, and also what you've done with the temporary accommodation money. So some people choose not to spend it on their temporary accommodation, and that has an impact on eligibility and when you could get the temporary accommodation assistance. So it's Thanks very much, Nikki. All right, so now we're going to move to the question and answer time. And uh, I know it's a bit of a big ask for me to ask you to just choose one question because I know that you all will have 100 and maybe after tonight's presentation you maybe you've got 200 or 300 or a lot more. I certainly do understand that and I certainly know that you want all of your questions answered. This is an attempt to help a little bit with that. But can I just ask you to choose your, your best question? 
and present that if you wish to ask a question. If someone else asks your question, then choose your second best and your third best and so on. And hopefully we will generate enough information that will help you in the room and of course people who are going to be watching this video later. So we're trying to help as many people as possible, which is why we are videoing it. All right, so the idea is that we'll be going through row by row and we're just asking one question. And it's really important that we capture your question, so please hold the microphone up close. All right, and if you feel like once that you've heard the answer, oh, I want to ask another question, can you just, if it's really burning, I'll let that question be asked, but we need to use the microphone so that it's captured, please. So just be a little bit patient with that so that we do capture the information properly on video so we can come back to it later. That's it. All right. So um, let's, we'll just start at the back and we'll just come through the front, sir. Um, thanks. Look, that was extremely informative, so thank you for that. Um, just one question. You talked about all the um, making sure we had um, um, costings or, or we had as part of the settlement amounts of money, contingency sums, etc., for various different reports and that. Is there any guidance on what they might, what sort of values we should be putting onto those? Because presumably there must be thousands of insurance claims where these things have already been considered and determined. So is there some help on that? So the short answer is it will vary depending on the property. So generally, if it's a new home build, it's a clear site, it's a group home build, there won't be as many contingencies. So the contingency amount would be less. If it's a repair, it would be more. You're right that we've repaired and rebuilt thousands of properties now. So provisional sums are a lot more accurate than they would have been a few years ago. Um, what you could do is if you had any concerns around any provisional sums, you can ask for quotes. So insurers will do as much work as they need to do to give you confidence around the cash settlement. It's just really what level of confidence you want. And you could ask what the provisional sum is based on, and generally it will be based on five other, other jobs, and that's an average of those jobs, and you could ask to see those. But it will vary depending on if it's a repair or rebuild. So there's, there's kind of a few ways that you can check that that costing's accurate. Um, so it might be that you just want to get it settled. So you say to your insurer, I'm not worried that these are provisional sums. Um, I'm not worried that you haven't looked at the roof or got some scaffolding to come out and have a look. Um, instead, I just want you to put a percentage of contingency on there to cover me just in case it ends up being more expensive. Um, other times you might want it to be more certain. So it depends on how risk averse you are. Um, if you want it to be more certain, then you would ask all those questions. But if you wanted it settled, you'd just say, look, can we get a percentage on top in case we do expend more? Thanks, sir. Ma'am. Thanks. Um, we've just gone over CAT, and um, we've got an engineer's report that we're happy with, and we've got two builders that we trust and have confidence in. And I'm just wondering, would IAG still want to do their own reports or would they just accept our report straight off? Definitely have a conversation with us about about what you already have. So I know of one that we cash settled a few weeks ago exactly on that. So in most cases, we do our own reports because the homeowner wants us to. But if you've got engineers' reports and builders' reports that you're happy with, we would just probably work with you and with a QS. So we'd want to quantify that the damage your builder and EQC have scoped is consistent with what your policy covers you for. And then we'd get a QS to check the costings. And as long as that's in line with um, other costings, then we'd be happy to settle on your reports rather than put you through months of additional reports for no different outcome. So see me afterwards and I'll get your details. Thanks, Renee. Thanks, ma'am. Just coming forward a row. Yeah, sir. Uh, yes, I've got a qu uh, question. I think Sarah raised it that, um, well, let's put it this way. We have, a, we have a home that was built in the 50s, which we consider a character home. It's had architectural work done on it. Uh, we employed an architect... And ever since then, IAG have basically been telling us that we had no right to, um, that, that won't pay architectural fees, et cetera, et cetera. And yet I'm sure uh, you, Sarah, said that we may be entitled to architectural fees depending on the type of house. OK, 
Okay, so I'd probably advise you then to look at your particular insurance policy. Um, and if you're having difficulty there, then you could come and see us and we can help you have a conversation with IAG about it. Um, because there is some case law about you know character homes and what you're entitled to to try and create the same thing. Um, but it all depends on the definitions in your policy. Um, but you can come and then um, to RAS and then we can initiate some conversations with um, IAG to settle that. I would just say in the first instance speak to me because I might be able to help you work through it. Thanks, sir. Ma'am. Hi. Um, we have received our, our cash offer from IAG. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they're wanting us to sign a deed of assignment of any land claim or any land payment from EQC saying over to IAG saying that our enhanced foundation cost is in fact land remediation and therefore they are going over and above the policy obligations. We're on TC3. We have to have the type of foundation that we have. Whether or not there is damage to our land, I can't see how that money should be handed over to IAG. Thanks for that question. So, there's basically two options and the reason that we've put the deed of assignment in place is so that we can keep your claim moving. So, the way that we see it, and Sarah just said we probably have different opinions on this, is that often the enhanced foundation negates the need for land remediation, which is why we would say you sign the deed of assignment, we do the enhanced foundation or include the enhanced foundation. The other option is we settle without the enhanced foundation and you keep the um, land payment. If you sign a deed of assignment and then you get paid money for anything outside of that foundation area, we pay it back to you. And it's quite clear in the settlement and it does say you would get the land pack, we would get the land pack if it's the land directly under the house. And so what we've paid for in the enhanced foundations um, means that we're entitled to that, then we would keep that from the deed. If it's for anything else, we would pay it back to you. We have had a letter back from the consultancy company that IAG have um, employed <coughs> saying that if we do not sign the deed of assignment, we will not get the enhanced foundation cost and therefore we will be reduced in our payment by $118,000. That's kind of holding that to ransom, I would have thought. Yeah, so the, so the option is you don't sign it and you, you don't get the enhanced foundation and then you get the land payment or you do and you assign the land payment. It's just because we're not responsible for land. So what we're saying is if we're spending the money to enhance the foundations, it's so that you don't have to. So we're spending it for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I understand. But the enhanced foundation often negates the, the need for the land remediation. That's the reason. So what we're trying to do is, cause the, if it's liquefaction risk, for example, in TC3, the increased liquefaction, liquefaction vulnerability payments won't be complete until the end of next year. So what we're saying is we're putting a deed of assignment in place so we can keep settlements moving for you. Or the other option is if we wait for all the IRL, ILV payments to be made so that we all know what the damage is quantified at and then we settle. But maybe... Did you have a different opinion, Sarah? And come and see me afterwards again, because I'll try and explain it more and see if there's anything else we can do for you. Um, so this is a legal thing that I think a lot of lawyers don't agree with the deed of assignment for land. Um, but practically, it's it's each person's claim that I would look at first or Raz would look at. So if you weren't increased flooding vulnerability and you weren't increased liquefaction vulnerability, um, it might be more practical just to assign it because it's unlikely that you're going to sue EQC for any additional land damage. Um, and it's unlikely that that payout's going to be so big that it's going to make, make a difference because you've probably had a loss in market value of that land. Um, but I, I'd probably say that if you're worried about that, you to talk to IAG, um, but also perhaps to see a lawyer or RAS to have a chat about that because it's quite a complex scenario which I don't think is going to be resolved as quickly as you want to resolve your insurance claim. Yeah. I really appreciate that question, so thanks for your patience on it. Thank you. 
Ma'am. Uh, just a reasonably simple question. In terms of cash settlement, how much time have you got to make the decision if you're going to manage your own repair? So there's a few different factors in that. Generally, if your insurer makes you an offer, um, so IAG, we would say go and get the advice that you need and what's a reasonable time frame for you to get that advice in. I think we do say 60 days, but we're not going to take the offer off the table in 60 days. Some other insurers might. And it will depend on what um, level of negotiation you're at. So if you've come to a stalemate and you're talking options with each other, they might say you now have 30 days to respond. Once you have accepted a cash settlement offer, then your only obligation to reinstate is really in terms of ongoing insurance cover. So we would say we will keep cover on the property um, as long as you make some kind of effort to fix the damage. And generally if it's a repair, we would say we would um, reinstate cover until your first or second renewal. So we might keep cover on it for 18 months. If you haven't made any kind of effort to reinstate the damage within the 18 months, then we would look at whether we continue to cover the property. So what I'd say with that one is I think just keep the insurer informed. So even if maybe they've given you a 14-day timeline, I think that's, that's far too short. But you just tell them what you're doing. So I'm going to see the bank or I'm going to see a, a real estate agent or I'm getting legal advice. Just to let them know that you are moving forward. Um, but they can't just take the offer off the table. If that's an accurate reflection of the cost to reinstate your home, then then that's an accurate reflection of the costs. So am I right with saying that people do have time? It's a quite a big question that's come up. The people. Um, yes, but just keep talking to your insurer about what you're doing. Okay, thank you. Sir. Hello, this is uh, mainly a question for Renee. Now, you were you were talking about. Um, uh, about the cash settlements and in a case where, for instance, uh, you've been a repair and then you've gone to a rebuild some six months ago and you've gone through the IAG process and followed the process as you've been told. Um, and in our case we have a 1930s house um, and so it's got a lot of characters, a lot of remu. And REMU, unfortunately for the insurer, is very expensive. But as you alluded to before, these things had to be taken into allowance. The walls are not covered with plaster, they're covered with heart REMU. So that adds an extra cost. Um, IAG chose to have quantity surveyors, um, QSs, PQSs uh, come and look at the house and then have that reviewed. When the first one was, came through, we pointed out things that we thought were inaccurate, we're told don't focus on the price too much, that we'll look at that later, and that we engaged the builder using the 514 form, which IAG instructed us to do, um, and that builder's gone through and done a price. Um, the week before the um, cash settlements were announced, we had a new person come to us uh, with a, um, a, had a look at our house, and uh, the next week he said that he was going to uh, give us a cash offer. Um, when I rejected the cash offer stating that, you know, the REMU hadn't been um, looked at properly and that the builder had had a specialist REMU for to come in and give a price for it, not an estimate, but a price to do the work, that at that point, after saying that to him, he's come back and said, we think you're a repair now and we're going to cash settle you on a repair because the cost is exorbitant. Now that doesn't fit what, what you've been saying for the last year, year and a half about that you will pay out for the accurate price for these items. So I'm just wondering, can you go back to a repair when you've been told that you're, and you've been given the forms, EQC has been informed that you are a rebuild and you've been paid out for your carpets and drapes. So, yes, because the reason is it will be, so that's uneconomic to repair. At the point we would have said it's uneconomic to repair because say the repair was 300,000 and the rebuild was 330,000. That makes more economic sense to rebuild. Can I just stop you there before you go on with a lot of stuff that doesn't really fit in. The, the reason that we were put to 
uh, rebuild was not because of econo it was economically not viable to do. It was because it couldn't be done because the foundations, the lateral spread on the house was outside the MBI guidelines and it's too close to the boundary and the ground permeability is not high enough. There are a lot of factors why you can't repair it. Yeah. Okay, well then that's a different argument and probably one that you need to come and see me about because it's quite specific. But I will answer just so that there's some general um, information on it. If we say that something's uneconomic to repair, and this is important in terms of cash settlement negotiation, if something's uneconomic to repair at $300,000 and it's a rebuild, once that rebuild, if that rebuild number starts going up and up and up to $800,000, then actually it is economic to repair. And so we are within our rights to come back and say what we have to do is pay the cost to reinstate. If we can repair for 300 because the rebuild's gone up to 800, then it is a repair. But if it's, that's, a, so there's two scenarios with rebuild repair. There's uneconomic to repair and then there's impractical to repair. And if it's impractical to repair, it remains impractical to repair unless there's different repair um, methodologies and technologies. So I, I know your claim and I think we should take it up afterwards because it's, it's quite specific. So come and see me afterwards. And, and I might have to disagree a little bit with that. I think if your insurer um, has investigated your home and has unequivocally communicated to you that it's a rebuild and you've relied on that, um, depending on how much information they had at the time when they made that decision, um, I don't think that they can go back on that. But if they were still doing investigation, um, so they were still working out the costs and they hadn't quite elected an option, then they can well, Choose, yep. the, the phrase that was said was that it was exorbitant, the price to rebuild. And the policy says that it's regardless of cost. So if it can't be repaired, it is regardless of cost. It was, in my opinion, that it should be paid out. So I th think you know that this is a very good question, which uh, we've got two different views on uh, and is not necessarily easy, which I think you have alluded to and everybody understands. But thanks for the question. Yes, so I agree with the man on my left. That added benefit in houses, as he's describing, needs to be covered in any settlement that is forced on you, as has been with us, as for him. We've been down this legitimate trail as proposed by you, followed the instructions, we've moved from one silo to the next on your decision making and we're at a point like him where the added value of our house, architectural house, needs to be reflected in any settlement and I don't hear any conversation about that at all. So how is that being addressed because there must be a lot of TC3 homes that are like that with really significant value inside. Absolutely. So I agree. And I'm not forcing anything on anyone, I want to say. But I agree. Everything that's in your house should be included in your assessment and in your scope. And if you're cash settling, you'd want to make sure that everything is included. I think that's a slightly different question. And I know your case and I am going to take it up with you afterwards. I think it's a slightly different question. But if you have a character home with Remu, yes, you're entitled to have that Remu included in your settlement. Um, there's a been a long debate about Remu floors and the debate around Remu floors is if they are a feature, they are included. If they're carpeted over, they're not. And so that's where there becomes some sticking points and there is legal views on that as well. But yes, extra value items are included in your settlement. So the first thing with your settlement is you get the scope, you agree the scope, then you agree that everything's in the scope and costed in the scope. So if you've got architectural features that you don't think have been included, then you should speak to your insurer. And if it's us, speak to me about it. it you should speak to your insurer about them being included. Thanks. So, uh, I can, thank you very much, ma'am. So, sir. I just wonder what uh, the legal opinion is around uh, full and final payment when you take a cash offer, because the rules seem to be changing all the time, and why shouldn't people that had been given a cash offer be upped when the rules change? And I've, one example is we've got a 1905 villa, which the indemnity value was 340000 the replacement value was 450000 when I pointed out that we don't have Kyrie in New Zealand, K-I-R-I, it's actually K-A-U-R-I, things changed a little bit and they upped their, 
the uh, value on the replacement to um, a figure around 600,000. Our own QS says the, plate, the price is 950,000. Now, all of a sudden, we are being offered money as a cash offer, which still miles and miles away from um, the figure that our QS says, and no contingency fee in there at all for professional or building costs. And yet I see the High Court, we were Southern Response obviously, uh, the High Court has indicated that contingency costs should be included. With the changing rules, why can't people that have already settled be given that difference in subsequent um, application to Southern Response? So I think it's going to depend on the particular circumstances of the claim. And I know a lot of lawyers are now looking into this about... Um, whether it really is full and final, but I think you'd have to get legal advice about your particular claim on whether or not it can be re reopened. Um, I have had one where it was reopened um, because both parties um, didn't know that the pool hadn't been included, um, but there are other circumstances as well, and a, a lawyer's probably the best one to establish whether or not um, your one can be reopened. Again, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, yes, um, my question is, I li live in a, uh, a flat, which is one of two. They have two different insurance companies. They had a loss adjuster, and the two insurance companies were working it out together. They couldn't come to an agreement. Um, so the other flat was uh, told that um, theirs would be a rebuild to start with, and then they changed it to a repair, but they offered them approximately $400,000 to repair the flat. My insurance company come to me and says, here's a cash offer. This is what we can do under, our, under your um, policy. We're offering you $230,000 and we're pulling you out. You've got one week to make a decision and if you haven't come back to us within that one week, we will put the money in your bank and that'll be the end of it. Um, I, I just wonder... Where can I go from here? Because the two flats, the next door neighbour's flat, they've um, got plenty of money. They're going to build a new foundation. They've told me that they're going to pack and jack mine, but they've got a common firewall, all kinds of things. I have employed a engineer, and he disagrees of what can be done. But I've got no idea how to move forward. Mm. Um, I would probably advise you to come see us at the Residential Advisory Service. Um, I think if they do just put the money in your account, you just send them a letter or an email saying that you're only accepting it as partial settlement until you've got advice about how much it's actually going to cost. Um, and then you can restart the conversation again with your insurer, either with a lawyer, with one of us, with one of our advisors or someone else. But the engineer is a good start. Yep. Okay, now I've turned the offer down. Okay. So that yep. is that's, what I want to know, where do we go from here? So can I suggest, sir, that uh, you do have a good talk with Sarah after this uh, and she'll help you with setting up a way to get support and a pathway from there. Thank you. Thank you. My question's probably a little boring compared with all the others. Uh, most of mine have been answered, but I have one for the BNZ gentleman. And I think I did hear you right. You will deal with um, customers from other banks? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. OK, yes. ma'am. I think Mike's question is relatively simple too. If you go through your scope of works and then sign it off, which I did last Friday, and then think, oh, hell, I should have asked about this, and oh, gosh, I should have asked about that, because I've signed it off, is that final? Can I go and add, please, this, 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 and this? Thank you. And the sooner you do it, the better. So, yeah, just make sure you contact your loss adjuster or whoever you've signed it off with. Thank you. Did you have a Thank question? you. Ma'am, do you... Did you have a question? Oh, OK. Um, if you accept a payout... Sorry, if you accept the payout, the settlement, and there is more damage to your foundations, which sounds to me like it would be very common because they can't see it um, and they don't know what the land 
type is underneath as well. So it could be hugely expensive, which is happening to some of my neighbours. Um, why don't they just take that into account and why can't they pay out for that as well? I mean, it doesn't sound fair to me. Um, so probably what I would advise is not to settle until you know. So um, like I was talking about before, if, if you don't want to take the risk, then it's going to cost more. It might be that you're insurer and you can sign a partial settlement. So you might agree with everything um, above the slab, but you leave the settlement open in case your foundations end up being more expensive. Um, again, the other options are like the contingency sum, so you make sure that there's a percentage applied. Um, but I would advise you to see someone to make sure that all the right investigation has been completed. Um, so if they haven't done the geotech drilling and you need it done to inform the solution, I would do that before you even think about settling your claim. Just check that all the right um, checks have been done in terms of your engineering solution.